Can you deploy a serverless application architecture based on Lambda using Kubernetes as the control plane? My name is Sai Venom, and today I'm joined by Christina Andonov, a senior solutions architect at AWS, to walk through that exact architecture. Uh, we're also going to show you a demo of how it can be done, and lastly, give you the code so you can do it yourself at home. Christina, I think the first question here is, why would you want to use Kubernetes to manage your serverless application architecture? Hi, Sai. If your organization is already using Kubernetes in production, you already built the authentication, the pipeline, so your uh, developer teams can deploy to the cluster. They have full control over their application. They can create them, update them, delete them, deploy to them many times a day. You have also built the compliance, observability, and everything to have a really strong Kubernetes foundation. And now you want to complement it with Lambda and running serverless applications. Then you should go for this setup. Okay, that makes sense. So here we've got a EKS cluster, a Kubernetes cluster on Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. We've got Crossplane installed in you know, an open source project allowing us to use Kubernetes to drive uh, infrastructure deployment. Uh, and exactly what we see here with Crossplane being able to talk to AWS to deploy our serverless application architecture. This is a pretty simple architecture we see here. We've got SQS, Lambda, and an S3 bucket. Uh, but first, I think we want to start here with the developer who is used to working with Git. So Christina, can we walk through this architecture here? Yes. In my past life as a platform engineer, I would start backwards, always from the compositions and how things work under the hood. But the key here for this architecture is the developer interface. The developers usually have access to their GitHub repository where they, they store their applications. From there, they have the tooling to deploy to the cluster. The key point for this architecture is they can add a simple claim that is a Kubernetes YAML called a claim uh, to their GitHub repository and deploy it to the cluster with the exact same CI CD tooling. That means there is zero cognitive load added to the developers to do this. The claim is the only namespaced resource when it comes to cross-plane. And what that means it means you can use the same RBAC permissions that are already set for dev developers to deploy to that namespace. From there, the claim creates some resources in your cluster that select the composition, and those compositions are predefined by the platform team. You have a parent composition and building block compositions. The building block compositions are pulled by the top level composition and that top level composition is responsible for the connection strings and the uh, IAM permissions to make the whole architecture work. From then, Crossplane is used under the hood to actually uh, talk to the AWS API and create the resources in AWS. So Christina, you mentioned that the developer experience here is critical and you want to make sure that they are used to using the same tools that they're traditionally working with to deploy you know, things like applications to Kubernetes. So they're working with Git and their same CI CD tools. Can you talk a little bit about how Kubernetes and the cross-plane model helps separate the responsibilities of the devs versus the operations teams? Yes, the development team would be only responsible for creating the claim. And that claim can be as simple as just give me the name of my serverless application. And it can have additional toggles exposed. For example, we can expose the memory of the Lambda function so a developer can control it. But it can be very minimal. And then the ops team can abstract everything else away from the developer, such as the permissions necessary in between the Lambda and the S3 bucket and all the connecting pieces and so on. Okay, so the, the way I understand it, we've got this composition here. This composition uses these building block compositions of SQS, Lambda, S3, but this composition deploys a very specific thing, this architecture with SQS, Lambda, and S3. 
but the critical thing here is the ops team has set this up and the composition and the base compositions and it's, this is all just waiting for a developer to say, hey, give me an instance of this application architecture. So they deploy you know, the claim manifest YAML to Git. That gets pushed to Kubernetes through their standard CI CD pipelines. And then this claim will, will, now that it exists, get picked up by the composition and kind of kick off the creation of this architecture. But this is a very specific flow, and all of this has been predetermined by an ops team. What if they wanted to deploy a slightly different architecture, one that's not addressed by this composition for this application architecture, but they still want to use the same building blocks? Could they do that? Let's say they want to trigger the Lambda function instead of with the SQS queue, they want to trigger it with the VPC endpoint. Okay. We can add a building block there that says VPC endpoint and then create another top level composition that will have that architecture. That's why we have the building block composition. So we have no code repetition on the operation side. Got it. So the ops team, they're able to more easily create kind of specialized application architectures by just using these base building block, creating compositions and then telling, hey, developer, create a claim and the, the necessary infrastructure should get created. So we're, we're uh, giving the ops team the ability to place the controls and, and all the config necessary and then expose a very simple, you know, give me the name of the application architecture, maybe some configurable things like the memory of the Lambda function, maybe some other things like the name of the bucket or the region that it's deployed in. Uh, the developer defines those and then the back end, you know, the, the, the cross plane pieces that are defined by the ops team takes care of the rest. Do I have that right? Exactly. Okay, so now that we kind of understand the application uh, architecture here, we understand how it's being deployed, let's see it in action. Christina, can we jump to the demo? Of course. Okay, you're on. All right. So right now we are in the developer repo, and as we can see, we have a folder called app. This is where our code is gonna live. This is just the usual developer code. And then, as I mentioned, right next to the application, we can drop a claim. And this claim will have the name. It can be any arbitrary name. It can have our image name with some version. And as we talk, we're going to expose a memory size. So right now, we can step back and look. This is simple YAML file that is all it takes to create the serverless architecture we discussed. So now let's see how that goes in action and let's deploy this file to a Kubernetes cluster. For that, we're gonna use Argo CD. We're gonna create an application and we're gonna call it test Lambda. I'm using Argo CD here, but I just want to mention any CI CD tool that can deploy to Kubernetes can be used. I use Argo CD because it has an interface and we can see the diff and I'll set the sync policy to manual so we can actually see it. If you do this, you might want to try automatic and then we'll have the source. and we're gonna deploy it to our cluster. And then we're gonna create the application. So as you can see, this application is already healthy and synced. The reason uh, that's the way it is, is because I had it pre-deployed to the cluster. AWS resources on average, they take more than five minutes to come up. Uh, and we have a lot of resources. So in essence of time, we have it pre-deployed. And let's make this a little bigger and see what actually deployed. So um, we can see here, we have some connections like IAM policies, event source mapping. We have the Lambda function. We have the SQS, sorry, this is the S3 bucket and we have the SQS queue deployed. So, so this, you know, I, I just wanted to point out one thing. So we've got Argo here. Argo could be running in our Kubernetes cluster. It could be running in a different Kubernetes cluster or 
you know, you don't even have to use Argo, right? You could technically deploy those manifest YAMLs manually that represent, you know, those different resources. Yes. Is that right? Okay. That is absolutely right. The only reason I'm using Argo is it has a nice UI and I, I'm a visual person, so I'd like to be able to see these things. Very cool. Uh, so it, it looks like there's so many resources here, but it, we only really created one claim, right? So how did all of these other resources get created? Remember on the diagram, the developer created the claim and here is our claim that it got created. Right. And then from there, it used all these compositions that were preset to scaffold out all these resources under the hood. And I understand it's a lot of resources, but this also helps with the developer interface. If a developer is able to see all those resources and something didn't go right, they can go and take a look at what happened and see the events, for example. Got it. That makes sense. So uh, even though there was one claim, that parent claim that got created, that kicks off the creation of a number of these kind of root custom resources or managed resources in, in the, in the cross-plane sense. And, and those are represented as Kubernetes artifacts that developers can dive into, debug, figure out what's going on. Yes. So we just saw how a developer can create the serverless architecture, but they don't only need to create it. The next thing that we talked about that they might need to do is update it. For example, they might need to bump up the memory. So let's see how they would do that. They'll come to their GitHub repo and update the memory. And then they'll commit it. So now that our claim is pushed to the GitHub repo, we can come here and remember I set up the Argo CD to manual, which means that we manually need to update it. And the reason for that is we want to see the difference. So if we go over here, we'll see the difference we want to deploy to the claim. And that is updating the memory from 256 to 512. Then we can go ahead and synchronize that. And so, so the changes are implemented incrementally and I'm um, impotent as, as Kubernetes YAML and manifest usually is. So it's only going to update the portion that needs to be changed, right? Exactly. It's only going to update the function. So if we go and take a look at our function, and right now the configuration is 256. All right. And now the memory is at 512. All right. What we basically saw here was that you can drive updates to our, you know, the end resources, you know, whether it's SQS, Lambda or S3 through our claim configuration at the parent. Exactly. So what we did is the developer created the serverless architecture. They were able to update the memory. But what if someone or something like a program or another Lambda came and changed this memory to something like 1028? Let's see what happens then. On the next reconciliation loop, Crossplane will come and set the memory back to 512. So essentially what we're seeing here is that even if there's any config drift, you know, something that comes and changes the configuration, following the true principles of GitOps, Crossplane is going to reconcile against the source of truth, which is in Git, not, not whoever comes in and changes some setting in the console. And, and what we've seen here is that it found that there was some config drift and automatically reconciled that, which is one of the core tenets of GitOps. We ensured what is in Git is what actually is deployed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we've seen this serverless architecture demo showing how we can deploy a serverless application architecture based on Lambda using Kubernetes as the control plane, folks at home, you're probably wondering, how can you do this yourself? Christina, we have this code published on GitHub, right? We do. Uh, I do. I and my team manage the cross plane on EKS GitHub repo that has examples for you to get started. And this example with a README with a step-by-step -step README is in there. 
Perfect. I'll have a link to that in the description below. Christina, I want to thank you for joining me today for the excellent architectural overview, as well as the demo. Hopefully we'll get you back on containers from the couch soon. For our folks watching at home, be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this in the future. Thanks for joining me, Christina, and thanks for watching.